all right i think that's uh enough time for <laughs> people to get on um all right hello everyone uh, and welcome to this evening's webinar it's the world music archives at wesleyan university uh we have our guest speakers aaron Battelle, jody cormack uh visha nothin and jennifer tom headley my name is herbert duran and i'm a member of arts programming committee um in the next month or oh, during this month we have two upcoming events um an exhibition tour of border crossings at the new york Public Library for the Performing Arts on March 16th at 12. Um, we also have a tour of the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Masonic Library and Museum on March 28th. Um, both, both events are sold out, which is good if you um, registered. Uh, and if you weren't able to, please you know, stay tuned for our upcoming events. Uh, we send out blasts every, every so often. We have a lot more uh, in store for you guys for the rest of the year. Um, without any further ado, let me just get, let's get on with it. I'm going to uh, do uh, bios for everybody and, and then we'll get started. So Aaron Battelle is the director of the World Music Archives and Music Librarian at Wesleyan University. Previously, he served as archivist librarian, head of digital projects at the UCLA Ethnomusicology Archive, and was also an adjunct faculty member teaching courses on audiovisual archives and oral history at UCLA. He has regularly contributed to the cultural collections field, especially in areas of education and training and research archives as part of the Association for Recorded Sound Collections, uh, the Music Library Association, and the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives. Aaron is also an active musician uh, with scholarly and performing interests in free read instruments and traditional musics of uh, Quebec, Ireland, and the Balkans. Jennifer Tom Headley has been a library assistant at the Wesleyan uh, University's World Music Archives since 1991, has also served on the library special collections and archives uh, staff, which expanded her understanding of archives practices. She holds a BA in music and MA in world music from Wesleyan and an MLIS from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, and Jody has been archives assistant to the director of the World Music Archives at Wesleyan since 1991. She studied and performed South Indian classical vocals uh, for over 20 years, additionally specializing in the music of South Indian classical dance. She received her MFA in music from California Institute of the Arts in 1975 and completed her doctorate in ethnomusicology at Wesleyan in 1992. Um, and okay, I think that's it. So some final housekeeping items, please note that this event is being recorded. So if you wish to turn off your cameras, please do so now. We ask that everyone silences their microphones for the duration of tonight's talk. Please include any questions in the chat box. We will have time at the end of the session to answer them. You will also find a link to the World Music Archives website in the chat box in addition to other art related items. So I'm gonna stop talking and hand it over to you guys. Thanks, Herbert. Uh, let's see, I'll share that. Um, can everyone see the, the slide there? Um, yes. Okay, thank you. I was hoping somebody would, would answer for <laughs> I had that moment where I realized, oh wait, now I can't see anyone's screens. Um, great, thanks. So uh, uh, thanks Herbert for introducing us. Um, I'll just say uh, one other thing that I'm sort of the, the newbie here in the World Music Archives. I've only been here about four and a half years. Um, Jennifer and Jody, uh, as you've heard, have a long history, not only with the World Music Archives, but with Wesleyan and, and that really, um, you know, as a university-based collection that really, I think, adds a lot to what we're able to do um, both with the collection itself and kind of our relationship with the rest of the university and they'll, they'll tell you more about that history. Um, I'm just going to get us kicked off by by saying there's a lot that we don't know about our early history. Um, like uh, a lot of these specialized research collections that you find at universities, uh, we started out as the um, personal research collection of a single faculty member, David McAllister, who uh, came here in the 1950s. He was a, an anthropologist 
um, and uh, what we now call an ethnomusicologist. Uh, he, he was, in fact, the founder of the Society for Ethnomusicology. Um, re did research with um, several indigenous uh, nations, and particularly with the Navajo. Um, worked fairly closely uh, with those communities throughout his life. Um, and that was kind of the foundational collection uh, that eventually became the World Music Archives, but we don't know exactly when uh, it started being called that, sometime by the 70s. Um, uh, but for a long time, it was a collection in the basement of the Anthropology Building and uh, eventually made it here to the library. Uh, so Jennifer will tell you a bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, but one other thing I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, we call ourselves the World Music Archives. Uh, Wesleyan actually offers a master's degree in world music. Um, I think to some people that can be kind of a contentious term. Uh, people tend to think of world music as the um, record industry genre label from the 90s, that, that kind of what we would maybe call global pop now, that's, um, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, there, there are issues with it. Um, but the way that we use the world, the term world music really goes back to the, the way that it was first coined actually here at Wesleyan in the 60s. Uh, and that was as a framework for approaching uh, all human musical systems and, and music making on an even playing field. So not privileging one type of music, um, you know, usually Western European classical music and kind of saying everything else is, is um, secondary or, or sort of a more object of anthropological study or um, but really kind of approaching them all, both in a scholarly way and in a, a creative way as performers and composers, um, sort of putting them all on a level playing field and, and looking at um, not just traditional music, but experimental music, which Wesleyan has a long history in as well, um, looking at those kind of all on an even playing field. Um, so you'll see, hopefully see examples of that throughout uh, our presentation. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Hi. Um, so I got to know the World Music Archives first when I started my graduate studies here at Wesleyan um, in 84. So I had been an undergraduate here and, and in, in piano and had not heard about the archives. But um, my first assistantship was um, to, to look after the archives. And although I think um, there have been several graduate assistants who knew a lot about archiving. I worked in without much knowledge at all. And my introduction was basically a tour, um, some guidelines, and then the time to just study up on the archives and see what needed to be done. So um, it was in the basement of the anthropology building, not, not um, perhaps the best location for archives, uh, but the, it was um, there was recording equipment um, and some adequate storage. Uh, most of the documentation was paper-based, so information about each item was either in on data sheets or uh, the commercial recordings were t typed card catalogs, um, card catalog cards, and um, there were there was also um, some uh, folders of documentation about, about the history of the archives. Um, so, uh, moving from that. Um, I one of my primary duties after I had learned about the archives was to handle some of the questions and do some dubbing and look into some uh, formatting of the uh, reformatting of the tapes. Um, but the uh, what was to become the biggest part of those early duties was to pack it up uh, for its eventual move into the main library here at um, Olin Library. Uh, the building had been expanded. And there was, uh, they had moved the music library collection from the music department, and that was primarily the scores and the commercial recordings into the library. And the World Music Archives soon followed in um, uh, 1986. Um, so the first full-time music librarian was Jim Farrington. He and um, a music cataloger, Chris Montgomery, um, undertook giving um, the World Music Archives the attention that it needed. So they applied for and received a small, five, well, a 
a grant from the Hartford Current Foundation to do the first complete inventory of the collection. And that allowed um, them to submit two successful NEH grants in 91 and 1993 um, to begin the uh, document uh, full cataloging and preservation of the collection. So their work plan um, was to hire three graduate students um, to take on a major part of that work. Uh, the first was John Kelsey, who was hired as a full-time cataloger. Chris Montgomery trained him and helped devise cat uh, um, cataloging rules, which uh, we were using Mark, but they're also specially developed for the um, uh, for our archives in the way we treated materials. Um, and Jody and I were hired as uh, to share one position, so we were each half time to work on um, reaching out to the donors to get permissions um, and also to develop doc, uh, procedures for how uh, the tapes were going to be preserved, as well as training um, our graduate assistants who would be doing the preservation work. And you can see some of the, um, I, I don't know if you can see, but behind me is some of the recording equipment that we had used then. Um, so the, the work plan was uh, for the preservation was to focus on the uh, more fragile tapes, such as the um, paper tapes and the acetate recordings, um, uh, beginning with David's collection, David McAllister's collection, um, and to make real-to-real -real preservation copies of the tapes, which was considered the best practice then, as well as listening cassettes um, for in-house listening. Uh, we have since moved from that to making, we moved to making CD copies, uh, both preservation and listening. And now uh, primarily we're making uh, digital files um, and also of course, collecting more born digital material into the collection. Um, after the uh, 93 grant ended, um, we faced a crossroads because there we hadn't been um, there wasn't staff funding for our archival positions. Um, so we received another grant from Louise Scripps to help tide us over. And eventually both Jody and my positions were folded into the music library positions. So we worked on both archive material and music library material and took on cataloging while John Kelsey moved to another position in the library. Um, so in a way that uh, also um, shifted some of the focus of the archives because uh, we began to work more closely with the music library. Um, and, um, since then, um, we, we've continued the work and continued working with graduate students to do a lot of the preservation and some of the cataloging. And let me see if I've covered everything. Um, I think I think that's it. So I will pass uh, this back to Aaron to talk more about our transition into um, the music library. Thanks. Um... So yeah, it, as Jennifer mentioned, the, the Music Library and the WMA started separately. Um, we sort of uh, came together now um, with the same staff and in the same space, but you know, in, in some ways, they're very different types of collections, right? A circulating, um, primarily scores and recording collection and an archival collection. Um, and until recently, we were part of the Academic Services Division in the library, which meant you know, the focus was really on the circulating collection. Um, that has recently changed uh, as we've become part of this new division of the library called Unique Collections. And um, I will, that will transition as to how we work now. Oh, one thing, sorry, I'm going backward in the slide because I skipped over. Um, I wanted to mention our mission, mission statement because that sort of illuminates this, um, you know, fuzzy distinction be between the music library and the WMA. Um, and we have one mission statement for both collections, um, even though they're different types of collections. And you can say, see here that, that um, it's very broad, um, supporting the scholarly and creative work of Wesleyan students, faculty, and the community at large, 
um, collecting, preserving, facility, facilitating engagement with documents of music in all its diversity. And those are, can be all kinds of documents, um, including, as uh, we'll talk about uh, shortly, um, musical instruments soon to be. Uh, so I mentioned unique collections. Um, this started out uh, about uh, four years ago or so as a group within the library of um, uh, collection managers for you know individual, mostly small collections, although it included the university archives and special collections and archives, but also smaller collections like anthropology and archaeology, um, East Asian art and archival collections, of course the World Music Archives, the um, our uh, prints and photographs collection, the Davis and Art Center. Um, <clears throat> we were all small units that um, are, are part of the library here at Wesleyan, but kind of, you know, were operating all on our own. And this group came together, was formed so that we could uh, come up with some common ways to teach with, uh, teach across the collections. So to work with faculty and students to, so they didn't have to go into one collection and another, but could kind of see the connections between them. And to also do programming across the collections and to start to address some of our common needs like better storage, better climate control, those sorts of things. Um, so fast forward uh, to this past August and that has evolved into its own department, which has really um, actually been great. We work closely together and um, it's helped us um, address some of those issues, although we still have a long way to go. Um, and a good example of that is until relatively recently, until about a year ago, the World Music Archives uh, had been effectively a closed collection because we just ran out of space. Um, we just, with very few exceptions, we were not Certainly we're not soliciting new collections and, and we generally weren't able to accept them because we just had nowhere to put them in. And kind of joining together as part of this bigger unit, we, we were able to, um, and, and through the generosity of some of our colleagues with, with actual storage space, we were able to, to um, uh, reopen the collection, which is great because we've been offered some, um, for us, rather large uh, donations in, in the last couple of years of collections that um, have really helped us expand the scope um, of the collection and kind of um, address that concept of world music that I talked about up front as being very, very, um, uh, I'll say global. I couldn't think of a better word than global, but yeah, you know, um, very expansive. Um, but, you know, in a lot of ways, it makes sense for us to be in the same unit with university archives and those other collections, because, in fact, we have a long history of, of shared collections um, for various reasons. And, and I think this uh, is something that also comes up in, in other university based um, specialized research collections like this, where we, we may have um, uh, for a good example is David McAllister. Um, you know, I said that's our founding collection. We have his field recordings, we have some of his field notes, um, but his papers themselves are with the university archives. And so we're able to kind of work together to support people working with those materials. Um, let's see. So now we're really working on building interest in the collection, building engagement in the collection uh, with the goal of encouraging faculty and students to uh, both, both work with the collections as part of the research and their creative practice, but also to contribute to the collections, um, to contribute their own uh, field research, their own compositions, um, to sort of really think creatively and, and, and think uh, about building um, a historical record of what goes on here at Wesleyan, because it's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on here between the the um, ethnomusicology program, the exper experimental music program. Um, a lot of musicians come through. We're halfway between New York and Boston, so we're sort of, um, you know, on on the road for for musicians who are touring in the Northeast. And um, you know, we've had a lot of great people over the years uh, here as visiting artists and and um, uh, visiting faculty. Uh, and so we're trying some new things. We're, we're um, we're being uh, sort of experimental um, in the tradition of Wesleyan, experimental with the way that we uh, present or, or the, the way that we um, try to generate engagement with the collections. So uh, one thing we've tried recently because, you know, with an object-based collection, it's easy enough to set up an exhibit and 
put objects in a case, a um, little bit harder with AV, right? Um, and so we came up with this idea to install a directional speaker um, and a projector so that we can show some items from the collection. Um, and this is actually in the main hallway uh, on the first floor of the library in a very sort of prominent space, uh, even though our area, the, the World Music Archives itself, is kind of up on the third floor, a little bit out of the way. We wanted to get something kind of down in the main traffic area um, and uh, uh, so that we could kind of bring the collections out and make them a little bit more visible. Um, and you'll see that sticker on the floor and, and it says, wait, stop and listen, because after we installed the speaker, we noticed students walking by, looking at the screen and, you know, wearing their AirPods or, or their noise canceling headphones and not even noticing that there was any sound to, to listen to. So, um, uh, Related to that, we are working on uh, we are working on doing things more with uh, more physical object based exhibits and um, sort of combinations of objects and AV. This is a project we're working on. This is um, Chance Kanyange. He's a grad student in the music department. Um, he studies uh, Burundian music, uh, particularly the Inanga, and he is curating an exhibit for us on African musical instruments that will. Um, include both instruments from his collection, um, from Wesleyan's World Instrument Collection, and uh, media from the WMA. Um, so we can kind of bring those all together uh, holistically. Um, it also, let's see if I can, uh, let's see if I can do this. Um, we've also working with another, um, with digital initiatives uh, department in the library, uh, have been experimenting with photogrammetry. Uh, which is creating 3D models, um, photo-based uh, three-dimensional models of some of the instruments that are in the exhibit. So that will be another part of this, um, the digital part of this exhibit. And you can see um, it's not not perfect, but but fairly detailed uh, to give people another way to to kind of um, interact with the collections. Oh, it's going to make me go through all this now. Um, <clears throat> uh, another thing that we're doing is we're really um, trying to work more closely with uh, other departments on campus. Uh, so this year is the 50th anniversary of the Center for the Arts here at Wesleyan, so um, it's a good time to, to um, bring out uh, material from the archives from, from the early days of that uh, and kind of add to the celebrations, which you'll see some of that later in our show and tell. Um, we're also working with a faculty member in music who is doing a 50th anniversary Wesleyan composers reunion, inviting back all the composer uh, and experimental music alums. Uh, and we're doing an oral history project around that um, to both you know, build, build the collection and um, contribute to the programming. Um, and so the future, you know, I've talked about how we're expanding the collection, we're expanding beyond just um, field recordings and, and sound recordings. Um, and we've also, oh, we've always had other materials. We've also always had some video and film and, and uh, photographs and things, but we're really expanding that, taking on score collections, um, early commercial recordings like 78s. Uh, and fairly soon, uh, I mentioned the World Instrument Collection here at Wesleyan, that's part of the music department, actually that very soon will be joining us in the library. So we will have a library collection, an archive collection, and uh, an object uh, collection. I won't entirely say museum collection because it's it's partly an active use, so it's going to present a lot of challenges for us, um, but I think also a lot of opportunities for the ways that we can kind of teach um, holistically with all these music materials. Okay, so now I think um, for, for all of you archivists, this is this is the fun part. This is when we're actually going to talk archives, um, and particularly what's different about media archives, because there's a lot when you're you're working with these AV formats, um, some technical and just sort of logistical particularities that that really make it challenging and and also fun uh, most of the time. Sometimes frustrating, but uh, a lot of times fun. <clears throat> um, so, you know, one of the challenges of time-based media is that they just have a short lifespan. You, you, you may know that um, particularly magnetic tape um, has, you know, there's been more awareness of that lately that most magnetic tape formats are only good for 
50 years, give or take. I mean, that's a, it's a very broad range and depends on storage conditions and the particular format and the particular formulations of a batch of tape and all sorts of different things. Um, but the media themselves are quite short lived compared to even, um, even acidic paper, um, let alone, um, you know, a more, what are considered archivally sta stable formats. Um, but, uh, Oh, and, and uh, you know, although we do actively digitize, you know, you all probably are aware that digital formats are even shorter lived and, and require, um, you know, more attention, more long term planning. And, and, and there's that in between period of digital recording media on physical on tapes and, and other formats. It was primarily tape, but there, there were a few others, um, too, um, that can be even even trickier to deal with from a preservation standpoint. Um, and then there's the fact that time-based media are all uh, mediated formats. They all require some sort of playback machine to be able to access. You can't, um, other than looking at, you know, the notes on a tape box or on the back of an LP or something, you, you can't access the content itself without some sort of player. And of course, those are also um, obsolescent and becoming difficult to find and difficult to repair when you have them. So that adds another layer of, uh, challenge for for both preserving and just providing access to these materials. Um, you know, another thing that is different uh, about these media collections, because we're an ethnographic, or we have sort of our roots as, a, as an eth ethnographic collection, and, and still, you know, the core of the collection is ethnographic, um, we engage a lot in what we call repatriation, although it's a little bit different than repatriation in the museum's context. In, in most cases, we're not actually um, giving original items back um, to the source communities, um, although we would if, if, you know, if we were asked. But, but with um, uh, ethnographic recording collections, usually it's more a case of providing, uh, of digitizing and providing the content back to the community so that they can have it, but they're also usually happy to have us have it and preserve it uh, as well. And that's not just with um, indigenous communities in the U.S. We do repatriation with, um, you know, any group that that we have their, um, you know, sort of cultural heritage recordings from their communities. We would consider that part of our repatriation. Um, I've heard it argued that that should actually be called digital return. That's maybe a better term for it, but um, we, that's what we tend to call it. Um, and then... <clears throat> You know, one other big challenge of dealing with time-based media um, is that you can have multiple copies, multiple formats, multiple generations, copies that turn up in different collections. It's not always clear which one you consider the, the preservation copy or the original or, um, uh, you know, it's not always exactly clear what your preservation top uh, target is when you're dealing with these materials, especially when you consider that some uh, that media archives early on in the 50s and 60s when they were starting to be built, um, often um, the one way that they would build the collection is by getting copies of materials from other archives, um, because that was the easiest way to provide access, obviously pre-internet. Um, but now, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, that makes it uh, more difficult for us as we try to tease out these um, where these different things are. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jody, who will talk a little bit more about some of these, these technical challenges. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so um, sound and media archives do indeed present a unique set of challenges. Um, and there are always issues that are either solvable or left hanging. And we've had to live with both. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things uh, uh, Aaron was just uh, talking about were multiple copies. Um, and we have a number of tapes that are indeed multiple copies of a single event. Um, with regard to following best practices and dealing with multiple cassette recordings of this, the same event, we've had to deal with either straight ahead copies, but also recordings of one event made by three different recordists. So how do you decide um, which of any of these recordings should serve as the principal preservation copy with the added complication that of where there are three separate recordists, one has to determine what program between them is lost when a given cassette tape, for example, is turned over. Um, 
our temporary solution because of uh, staffing limitations has been, we've, we have opted to preserve all of the duplicates or the copies and deal with providing the best or most complete version at a later date. Um, <clears throat> there are also workflow challenges for us. Uh, we deal with a revolving door of graduate students whom we've had to train to do preservation work and cataloging. Um, some excel at archival work and some struggle with attending to detail. Um, and with the volume of materials being processed and with our limited staff, quality control can become an issue. Um, when, um, when for, uh, with regard to volume levels, for example, particularly when we shifted from analog and caref carefully calibrated open real machines to digital files, students might randomly adjust the, the levels. <laughs> um, so we have some recordings that are really low and some that are too hot. Um, mislabeling can happen. There can be documentation mistakes. And we've just, again, because of limited staffing, we've just had to live with these. And as we come upon them again in the future, we'll correct those things. Um, then there's uh, collection development and the problems that can come with that. Um, <clears throat> one, one of our big challenges was uh, uh, with uh, a, an, off, uh, an offering of 30 years of recordings of a huge range of folk music, folk blues and world musicians from one of the most uh, prominent Northeast coffee houses, the Town Crier, um, which is now in Beacon, New York. Um, it, it's a huge collection. It was very hard to pass it up. Um, first problem we encountered was where to store it. And uh, it found its home first in the music department in an office, and then went, it went to a basement in our world music hall. And then it was in a small seminar room in our science library. And then it went into our Olin library attic. And then finally, um, after a lot of reorganizing, it wound up in our uh, world music archive storeroom where it sits today. Um, one of one of the most difficult things with this particular collection was getting funding to process it. And our main stumbling block with this was a lack of formal permissions uh, from the artists because the cafe presenter only had informal spoken permission to re record. <clears throat> and so this made online uh, accessibility problematic. So how are we dealing with that now? Well, we're not. <laughs> We're simply, uh, we're inventorying hundreds of con these concerts, most of which are split up on two sides of different tapes. And it's going to take quite a while to sort that out. Um, and finally, uh, one, another issue would be how do you prioritize uh, within a large collection? And what criteria should be used when you're familiar with materials of equal importance or value? Um, for us, most of these decisions are project driven, but then there's the issue of important recordings on fragile tape that's starting to disintegrate. And it's it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult situation. So, um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Aaron. Thanks, Jody. Yeah, you know, and, and um, Jody mentioned the difficulty with the, the town, town crier collection, um, the, the um, traditional music uh, and, and blues and folk cafe collection. Um, and I think that that points out something else that's particularly a challenge for both media collections and ethnographic collections is that copyright, uh, both copyright and also some of the deeper ethical issues when you're dealing with um, fieldwork recordings that, that were created with a particular understanding between a researcher and the community they were working with. It's often very personal, very one-to-one. -one, um, and you know, there wasn't necessarily documented permission. And we, we you know, we generally trust that the researcher had a, a good and honest relationship with the community, but, but that doesn't mean that, you know, 50 years ago or more, um, that people were anticipating that things would be available on the internet. So there are lots of reasons that, um, you know, probably large parts of our collection are not um, able to are, are not going to able be able to be online. So, um, you know, it just means we have to think more creatively in, in the ways that we 
uh, try to generate engagement in the collections um, since online is, you know, these days is sort of the, the, the first stop for making things available. And, and for us, you know, only parts of our collection will be able to go online. Um, I should mention, though, about that project, though, that, that our former director, um, Alec McLean, was able to get a grant from CLEAR to, to preserve a good portion of the projects from, from two of the major festivals that, um, that were sponsored by the town crier. Um, so those have been preserved. Um, and, and we're working through the rest of co the collection, but as jo Jody says, it's, it's really, um, really massive. Um, at least by our standards. Um, so now we get to the the fun, fun part, <laughs> the show and tell. Um, since you all can't be here uh, up in Middletown, um, Jennifer, Jody, and I picked a few of our favorite items from the collection to play for you. Uh, so I'm going to start out, since I'm the new guy, I'm going to start out with some of our more recent recordings. Um, one of the things that... Um, we have done over the years, we've had a relationship with the Middletown House Concert Series, uh, brings traditional musicians through, and, and we've often recorded those and included them in the archive. And uh, in more recent years, we've also brought the musicians in to campus to do um, lecture demos and workshops and, and other materials. So we, um, this is one from uh, this past May, uh, Irish fiddler Jerry O'Connor um, giving a talk about his research on um, uh, late 19th century Irish uh, music manuscripts. Um, and he he did actually talk as well, but it was it was truly a lecture demo. He went back and, and back and forth and and um, actually was you know not just playing recordings, but actually able to to uh, demonstrate the pieces that that he had researched. That was a lot of fun um, in our special collections um, rare book reading room. Uh, let's see. Um, so another thing we're doing is working closely with faculty in our music department. Um, one of those faculty is Jin Hee Kim, who is a composer and performer um, who blends uh, traditional Korean, uh, Korean traditional music. She plays a, a, a very old instrument, uh, the komongo. I think it's one of the oldest um, known, you know, currently played Korean instruments, uh, but um, combines that with a, a very deep um, uh, practice in experimental music. Uh, she's been very active and as a performer and composer and has collaborated with lots of um, you know well-known experimental musicians in the new york scene uh, and so we were able to when we acquired a bunch of her scores for the collection um, and later some of her recordings uh, we were able to um, uh, do an event uh, in the library around that So she, she both talked about her compositional practice 
um, as, as embodied in, or notated in the scores and then also was able to demonstrate that for us. Um, another faculty member we've worked with, Say Seyda Daukayeva from Kazakhstan, has done extensive field work in Central Asia. Um, and so we were able to work with her to get some of that field work digitized. Ханда, Боинга, Манау Кондрар, Кусунда Бар Карагам, Тегендевала Карасам, Ахжолан, Манау Келиганде, Синдевала Аянаб, Халмас Сан, Манау Кхолумен, Сухагет Кен Карагам, Талгар Майда Демиме, Осабар Манау Тегенде, Ахжолан, Бала Келигамбр, Касиетан Карагам, Алдана Манау Салгамбр, Бугундевала Карасам, Синдевала Кхолумен, Талайла Манау Кеткембр. Um, and finally, I'll talk about a, a very um, new project actually getting ready to, ready to launch in a few weeks. We're working with a um, recent graduate of Wesleyan's music uh, program, uh, the master's program, Mohammed Geldi Geldi Najad, um, who is both a scholar and performer in a, um, a Turkmen uh, Bardic uh, tradition. Um, and so Mohammed has actually been um, processing his own fieldwork from uh, Iran and Turkmenistan, uh, as well as archival recordings that he acquired from the families of uh, master bardic musicians that were made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s um, that have all been digitized, and those are all going into a, a digital collection that should be launching um, in the next month or so, um, and it's a fairly rare, um, rare to have that uh, sort of a focused detailed collection of, of Central Asian music and particularly this bardic tradition. So that's something really special that we've had, um, you know, really kind of a leading expert here working with us. Uh, Mohammed, in fact, was declared a bardic master at age nine. Um, and so he gave a, a lecture demo for us a few months ago, and I'll just play a little clip of that. So now I'll pass along to Jody for a couple of her examples. Um, so these are, uh, we have probably one of the largest South Asian collections uh, in the Western hemisphere, I would say, um, of North and South Indian music at, and particularly the quality of the music with regard not to the recordings necessarily or the quality of the recordings, but the musicians involved. Um, here we have an historic version of, uh, um, it's a uh, sung, uh, what, how, to, how to describe it? A shloka is a Sanskrit poem that usually takes place at the end of a dance concert, a classical Bharatanatyam dance concert. And the three or actually all four artists, five artists are from one family. Um, Raja, uh, Raja Lakshmi Amar and Jayamar are sisters. Bala Saraswati was uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, Bharatanatyam dancers of the 20th century. That's Jayamar's daughter. Vishwanathan uh, and Ranganathan were both at Wesleyan. Um, they were both master musicians. Vishwanathan got uh, was awarded with the National Heritage Fellowship Award from the NEA 
And um, this is an All India Radio performance from South Agartha Sukurta Nam Sulabham Navam Bodha Shamam Nalina Nayanam Valkalatharam Jata Juta Pidam Bujagapati Bogo Bama Bujam Namami Sri Ramam Vipinabusita Sahacharam um and this is a uh Aaron, is this a video or an audio recording? This is video from okay. okay. So we have a, a a Navaratri festival every year. It's a traditional Indian festival, nine nights usually. Um, Birju Mohan Maharaj was considered or, or one of the greatest Kathak dancers in North Ind of North India, and um, Zakir Hussain, who many of you might have heard of, uh, is a tabla player <clears throat> par excellence who now lives in the States, but uh, he's just, he's, the, there's a, the interplay between the dancer and the drum is just extraordinary in this case, it's all improvised. Sorry about this. The dangers of using SharePoint or um, uh, PowerPoint online. There we go. And uh, finally, I'll turn it over to Jennifer for her examples. Um, just to keep it short, this is from um, the opening of the uh, Center for the Arts, uh, Wayang, a shadow puppet play from the Gamelan tradition of Central Java. The puppeteer is Omar Topo. And this is an example, as Aaron said, of the way we we could help document and contribute to the celebration of the history of the university. Yeah, and and this is one of our newest digitized recordings. We actually just got this back, and it's it's some of our oldest videotape. Um, it's actually 1973, not 74. So um, we weren't even sure it would play, um, and we just got it a couple of days ago. So we we're super excited to see this. What is this? It's my belly. Not, no more 
until barely enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Where are you from? Me? Yes. <laughs> I'm from... I'm from... From where? From Strikarta country. Strikarta country? Mm, Strikarta country. How about you? Where you come from? From San Francisco. <laughs> And here's a recent video um, you can see from April 2022. Um, Aaron, we this was one of those recordings where we had uh, cameras and documentation in, in different places. And Aaron stitched it together uh, for a clip that we could share with, um, with the university, so. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. What is the story tonight? The story is about this gigantic demon king. The name is Ni Woto Kawoto, who is falling in love with a celestial or celestial nymph. Heavenly maiden by name of Tsukoko. Then what happened? My lord, how to know success in his meditation, then he was he is given a shell, shell propelled arrow of Pasopati to exterminate the evil in the world by new. And then I think we have one more. Oh, we wanted to, um, since we were, uh, since we began speaking about David McAllister, uh, we wanted to end with one of his recordings. Um, as, as Aaron mentioned, he's most known for his work with the Navajo traditions, but he also uh, worked with other um, musicians. And this is a recording that he uh, made of Sam Hare, who is in, who is a Cherokee um, person who was invited to Wesleyan to meet with the students and to make some recordings. And um, there was another professor at Wesleyan who was studying Cherokee language, uh, Willard Walker. So uh, this recording um, and the and Sam Hare's presence at Wesleyan kind of uh, ties together a lot of different. Um, threads. Um, and uh, this recording has since been made, um, been shared with uh, people who are trying to keep the tradition going. And um, they've been learning the music in order to continue to use it in, um, in their uh, celebrations in the spring. So. This song, what we sang in our decoration day, which we call our memorial day, but we call our decoration. And then here's the song that I'm going to sing. That's the song we sang when we march towards the cemetery. <laughs> Um, and so that's it. We have, um, I think, just a couple of minutes for, for Q&A. Um, but here's our email address, wma at wesleyan.edu, easy to remember. Um, please reach out to us if you have um, questions or, or just anything you want to talk about the collection. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat that Jennifer has answered so far, but uh, 
Does anybody have any other questions? So I was, I was just going to say, if you have uh, questions, please put them in the chat now, and I'll and I'll I'll try to uh, feel uh, read through them. Um, but also, I just want also wanted to say thank you for making that distinction early on in the presentation that, um, you know, the definition of world music because, you know, some of us might have been expecting Enya or, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. So I think uh, Wilson Jones had asked, "Are you planning on making access?" Wait, I'm sorry. Are you planning make access to your collection via linked data? Um, oh, yes. Sorry, I see J Jennifer. That was a note to me, not not um, answering the question. Um, so I think do, um, if that means access to the um, uh, to the individual uh, records or to to digital objects, I'm not I'm not entirely clear. Um, at the, the moment, you know, we're sort of shifting from um, as Jennifer mentioned, we've, we've traditionally uh, done item level mark cataloging, not kind of the way that archives would, tradition, would typically do it, but, but more of an, uh, a library model. Um, we are shifting to um, creating collection level records and then more detailed finding aids in archive space. Um, and so I think those finding aids will be um, discoverable um, through uh, uh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, I think they'll be discoverable online. I don't know if, if they use a particular linked data service um, for the finding aid. So, so the answer is um, not at the moment, but um, maybe eventually. Have you figured out how to deal with intellectual property with personal agreements not written and make it available to public? Yeah, that's that's um, really difficult. And like I said, I, I, we, we tend to err on the side of caution, although um, uh, copyright wise, I think, you know, we and, and the general library community is is sort of opening up and being a little bit less cautious and obviously there's there are dangers with that as we see with the the internet archive lawsuit but um i i think we we try to err on the side of caution particularly when it's ethnographic materials um so for the most part our, our default is actually to make things available only within the university uh, unless you know we either have um have able been able to go back and get um, permissions retrospectively, um, or we've able, been able to talk with um, somebody in the community that, that you know we think is is, and, and this can be difficult. This is someone who who you know is, can kind of represent the interests of the community and, and who knows about the community and kind of tell us, no, this is okay. These things are okay. These are not, you know, often we're dealing with materials that we don't ourselves have expertise in because, um, you know, we're really covering the, the whole world in all sorts of different traditions. But, um, you know, fortunately we do have a lot of material that took place here at Wesleyan that, that we can make available. Uh, generally, it's it, it's still not necessarily up right now. More just for practicality reasons, because you know things need to be processed, digitized. Um, you know, and that's one reason that that Muhammad Geldi's collection that I mentioned, the Turkmen music collection, is so exciting because um, you know we're working with someone who's both a scholar and in that tradition and is directly in contact with the musicians he recorded and is able to give those permissions for. So that is one that we'll be able to go fully online. But yeah, I think a lot of the collections um, at the moment with, with the documentation that we have won't, um, won't be online anytime, won't be publicly online anytime soon. They'll be, they'll be in a more restricted way. Yeah, it's kind of like what uh, Jody said earlier, where it was um, certain issues are solvable. Some of them are left hanging and with like copyrights, that's definitely one of the, you know, that's what happened. Um, what are you doing with pieces made prior to the copyright laws of today? I guess that's... Um, 
That, well, for sound recordings, that, uh, uh, that is, is sort of less pertinent. Um, you know, with the, the most recent, um, the Music Modernization Act, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, still sort of learning the details myself. Um, the Music Modernization, Modernization Act that was passed a couple of years ago now, um, finally established a federal public domain, but that only goes back to, I believe, 1924. I believe it's a hundred years at this point. Um, prior to that, uh, you know, it's, there still wasn't, um, you know, it's much more of a gray area, but I, I would say it doesn't, uh, I don't want to put this. I, I, I think in, in, in reality, it hasn't changed a lot for us, although the, 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 the MMA, the Music Modernization Act, has put, put some um, uh, assurances in or, or some, some provisions in for archival preservation and, and access that were not um, formally in the law before that. So that, that has helped. But, um, you know, in, in reality, for our collection, because of the types of materials we deal with that that hasn't changed a lot for us okay and one more question if that's okay then everyone has to go to bed um uh what is the criteria for accepting music into the collection and who decides um so in general you know it's it's very broad as i said we're kind of looking at all um music and and i should say the collection is not only music we have oral histories we have other spoken word materials we have um, as you saw dance um so it's not um exclusively music although it is primarily music um we are working on a formal collection development policy which is not something that we have had but in general you know um we look for like any archive we we, we try to take things that we can be responsible stewards for so if, if it's just really beyond our capabilities to preserve um and and provide access to these materials we, we will try to find a different you know help the donor find a different home for them and um uh you know beyond that we really try to build the collection particularly in areas that are of interest to our to our faculty and students um so you know you saw um in some of our examples um Saida Daukieva, who's a relatively new faculty member here uh Mohammed Geldi several other students who um uh, who come from Iran and other Central Asian countries. Um, so we've been really building that part of the collection recently because we have a lot of interest there. And, and you'll see in the collection, even though, um, you know, our, our conceptually we cover the whole world, we, like any collection, we have areas of strength. So we have um, quite a lot from uh, South India uh, and, and North India, but particularly South, as Jody said, um, from Indonesia, from West Africa. Um, Native North America, because those have been areas that, you know, over our history where we've had a lot of um, activity of faculty, students, visiting artists, etc. Right. Well, thank you, Aaron, Jennifer, Jody, for this thorough, awesome presentation. And I think it was a privilege to be a to have been able to listen to some of the sounds and see some of the videos that we got to see today. Um, so yeah, and then also um, uh, a recording of this presentation will be sent out within a week. So I wanna share that um, if some people came in late. Um, yeah, and reach out to, to Wesleyan if you have any questions, I guess, or any further questions. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you guys. for inviting us, it's great to talk to you all. Thank you. All right, y'all. Have a good night.